This Can't Be Happening at McDonald Hall by Gordon Corman, expelled. At precisely nine on Sunday morning, a knock sounded at the door of room 201. Bruno was still in bed, but Elmer was awake and dressed, taking care of the new algae eater in his fish tank. He dried his hands and opened the door. There stood the school messenger, one of the freshmen. Boy Drimsdale, he said. Are you Boy Drimsdale, he said. Are you ever in trouble? He handed Elmer a note, which ordered him to present himself at the headmaster's office in one hour's time. Elmer collapsed in a heap on his bed. I knew it, he moaned. Someone must have seen my telescope in the window last night and reported that I was up after lights out. My telescope will probably be confiscated. I may even be punished. I've never been punished in my whole life. In agony, he hugged his pillow and his hand closed on a pair of silk panties. Elmer screamed so loudly that Bruno bounded out of bed in alarm. What are these? cried Elmer, waving the panties in Bruno's face. If you don't know, Bruno replied, then I can't help you. I can only assure you that they're not mine. But where did they come from? Elmer shrieked. How did they get here? Bruno pretended to think about it for a moment. Then he stared at his roommate in horror. Elmer, you? What do you mean me? The panty raid at Miss Scrimmage's last night, said Bruno. It was you. I wouldn't have believed it. I thought you said girls were so icky. What panty raid? I'm innocent, Elmer screamed. I'm going to get blamed for something I didn't even I don't even know about. In each life, some rain must fall, said Bruno philosophically. Whatever you sow, you must reap. The messenger had continued to dormitory one. Boots took the note from him and woke George. Note for you, George, from Mr. Sturgeon's office, George yawned sleepily. Oh, that must be about my allowance from Papa. He accented the second syllable. He always sends it by special messenger. I can hardly wait to see if I got the raise I asked for. Boots smiled. Maybe you'll get even more than you asked for, he said. When George reached the office, the door was open, so he knocked, then went right in. As he entered the room, he was surprised to see Elmer Drimsdale seated meekly on the bench. George walked toward the visitor's chair, but Mr. Sturgeon motioned him to sit beside Elmer. George was puzzled. Mr. Sturgeon opened his top desk drawer and pulled out a plastic bag. From it, he took out one rodent skull, one Toronto Horticultural Society membership card, and a labeled test tube. He made a second pile with a money clip, a cell phone, and a pen and pencil set, all clearly monogrammed. I believe these belong to you, the headmaster said grimly. Yes, sir, George stammered. Now thoroughly confused, Elmer was speechless. These items were gathered at Miss Scrimmage's last night after a disgraceful episode during which some articles of her underwear were stolen. George began to sweat. The discovery of these items, Mr. Sturgeon continued, has led everyone to conclude that you two were the raiders. Unfortunately, I have no alternative but to agree, he smiled grimly. You were even identified by name by several of the young ladies. George began to sweat even more. He reached for his handkerchief to wipe his forehead and pulled out a pair of pink panties. Yipes, he cried. That will do, said Mr. Sturgeon. I rather think that the strange substitute for a pocket handkerchief com completes the case against you. But, sir, pleaded George, I have no idea how that got in my pocket. <clears throat> Mr. Sturgeon's smile changed. Then I imagine you think your thinking is a little slow, Wexford Smythe. I am quite certain I know how it got there. I found some things like that under my pillow, Elmer gasped. I'm not surprised to hear that, said Mr. Sturgeon. It seems you two boys have been very nicely framed. For the first time since he had received the summons, Elmer felt a surge of hope. He still had very little idea of what he had been framed for, but so long as he wasn't going to be punished, his world looked as if it would keep on turning. Melvin, George exclaimed. It was Melvin, wasn't it, sir? And that uncouth friend of his, Bruno Walton. Bruno, echoed Elmer sadly. I've had enough of Bruno to last me a lifetime. Is Walton harassing you? asked Mr. Sturgeon. Elmer shook his head. Oh, no, sir. It's just that he's so unrestrained, and I'm so... 
I guess I seem dull to him, sir. I don't think he likes me. Melvin, uh, Melvin is certainly harassing me, sir, George broke in. He should be punished if you ask me. I fail to recall asking you, said Mr. Sturgeon, giving George his infamous gray look. But then he leaned back in his chair. Boys, I would like to try an experiment. This is what I want you to do. Elmer Drimsdale, head down, his feet dragging, returned to his room and flopped down on his bed. What's the matter, Elm? asked Bruno, bursting with curiosity. Aren't you going to crack the old books? Books, sobbed Elmer. What's the point? I've been expelled. Bruno's normally ruddy face turned chalk white. What? I can't do this to you. You're innocent. You didn't do anything. I know that, said Elmer. But Mr. Sturgeon didn't believe me. He expelled me. My mother is going to kill me. But you were scanning the skies, Bruno howled. The Crab Nebula, remember? Elmer didn't answer. He took his suitcase from the closet, opened his dresser drawers, and began to pack. Bruno stalked up and down the room like a madman. You don't have to pretend you're upset just to make me feel better, said Elmer sadly. I know you hate me and will be glad to be rid of me. What do you mean, hate you, Bruno cried. I'm crazy about you. I love your ants. I love your goldfish and your plants. I'm absolutely wild about your experiments. I'm a Drimsdologist. My world is the Elmer Drimsdale world. On that note, he ran wildly out of the room. I have been expelled, Melvin, George announced bitterly. I leave immediately. Expelled? Boots echoed. Leave? Why? Elmer Drimsdale and I are being blamed for what ha- for whatever happened in Miss Scrimmage's last night, said George. He began to pack his medicines into a large leather chest marked health care. We've both been expelled, and... He turned around to find he was talking to an empty room. Boots tore across the campus toward the faculty building. He didn't know what he was going to say to Mr. Sturgeon. He only knew he could not allow George to be expelled for something he hadn't done. He ran blindly, his mind in a turmoil. Just at the foot of the cement walk, he collided heavily with another running figure. Bruno, we can't let it happen. You too, eh? Bruno replied. What are we going to do? What can we do, asked Boots. Besides confess, that is. Confess nothing, countered Bruno. If the fish is ready to expel Elmer and George, he'll be ready to hang us. Listen, we don't have to say we did it. We just have to say that Elmer and George didn't. We're their roommates, after all. What better alibi could they have? He'll never believe us, Boots said dejectedly. That was the stupidest thing we've ever done. Well, it was your idea, muttered Bruno. Come on. The oak doors had never been heavier. The echoes of their footsteps on the marble floor sounded like a death march in some great tomb. The desks in the outer office had never seemed so high, nor the white walls so desolate. The office was deserted, but Mr. Sturgeon's door was open a crack. Boots knocked lightly. It's Melvin O'Neill, sir. Bruno and I would like to talk to you. A muffled sound escaped from the inner office. It sounded very much like a chuckle. And the words, right on time, then the headmaster called out, come in, come on in, boys. On their way in, Bruno and Boots exchanged puzzled looks. What was going on? Mr. Sturgeon didn't speak, did not speak until the two were seated uncomfortably on the hard wooden bench. Finally, he said, why are you two boys together? Um, we aren't exactly together, sir, said Bruno. We just ran into each other on the way over here. Very well. Now, what brings you here? Sir, Bruno began, you can't expel Elmer Drimsdale. And George, added Boots fervently. You can't expel him either. Sir, how odd, said Mr. Sturgeon. I was under the impression that I was the headmaster of this institution. I believe I have the power to expel any student who misbehaves as grossly as the two boys you just mentioned. But Elmer was in his room all the time, Bruno protested. He couldn't have been at Miss Scrimmage's. George, too, said Boots. He came home from the dance and never left our room until the fire alarm went off. Mr. Sturgeon smiled icily. So, he said, instead of being able to complain that Groomsdale and Wexford Smythe are unsuitable roommates, You are obliged to come here and defend them. He knows, thought Boots miserably. He knows everything. Contrary to popular belief, the headmaster went on, I am not as stupid as some of you think. I was a boy once myself, you know, and I understand all the little tricks. His voice continued colder than ever. 
What two cry could do to your roommates was thoughtless and cruel. They are, of course, in the clear. I never for one moment believed they were guilty. It was I who suggested that they pretend to be well, just to see what kind of boys you two really are. Bruno and Boots sat in stunned silence. Had you not come to me to prevent their expulsion, I would have immediately sent you both packing. He paused to let his words sink in. The silence was deafening. However, the fact that you have done the right thing does not mean you will get off scot-free. Miss Scrimmage's flower beds and bushes have been badly trampled. You two will therefore report to the gardener set every morning at sunrise to work and repair the damage. Any new supplies which may be required will be purchased from your pocket money. This means, Walden, he added, that you will join O'Neill for dishwashing duty since your allowance has already been used up to pay for the exterminators. You know the rates, I believe. Yes, sir, said Bruno. As for you, O'Neill, your privileges were suspended for the remainder of the year are suspended for the remainder of the year. Walton, at the rate you're going, yours just might be restored to you by the time you reach the age of forty three. You may go. The boys stood up. Yes, sir. Thank you, sir. Mr. Sturgeon actually smiled at them. I am glad to see that instead of complaining about your punishment, you appreciate what was not done to you. Please go to your rooms and separately. Good day. Bruno and Boots left the office and headed back toward their dormitories. Moments after the boys had left, Mr. Sturgeon's telephone buzzed. He grimaced. That's right on schedule, too. He lifted the receiver to his ear. Hello? Yes, Miss Scrimmage, I was just about to call you. I'm sending two of my boys over to repair the damage. They'll be working from sunrise every morning. Yes, Miss Scrimmage, we intend to cover all losses. Miss Scrimmage, with all due respect, I must ask you not to refer to my boys as hoodlums when your girls were responsible for the riot. Oh, yes, they were. My boys could not possibly have achieved that result without inside help from those female barbarians of yours. I've told you, your flowers and bushes will be replaced. My boys merely thought they were rescuing your girls from a fire. What about your sign? May I remind you that it was, a, that it was no one from McDonald Hall who shot a hole through it? Well, perhaps you should teach them fishing. They certainly aren't learning manners, and furthermore, Miss Scrimmage... Miss Scrimmage! As Mr. Sturgeon replaced the receiver, a picture flashed through his mind. Boys milling and shouting, girls running and screaming, and on the balcony, Miss Scrimmage with her shotgun. He put his head down on his desk and laughed until the green blotter was soaked with tears. And that is the end of that chapter.